Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start here in about uh, in about one minute. Um, before we do, uh, just a quick announcement: we're running two uh, defense-related programs this morning. So if you're here for the China uh, defense budget discussion, that's next door. Um, but if you're here for the IMET uh, discussion, you're at exactly in the right place. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernie Bauer. I'm the uh, chair of the Southeast Asia program here at CSIS. And this morning we have a, a real treat. One of the things we, uh, we have been thinking about uh, at, at CSIS is um, how, the, uh, how do we do the pivot and at the same time uh, uh, work through the sequester and the, uh, and the budget cuts that are coming, uh, particularly on the military side uh, of the fence. One of the programs that uh, could be most vulnerable uh, in, in that situation is called the IMET program, or the International Military Education and Training Program, IMET. IMET was actually created uh, in 1961 with Foreign Assistance Act, and um, we have uh, have provided IMET funds. Uh, we're going to be looking at Asia and, and specifically Southeast Asia here, although the speakers are, are welcome to uh, refer to a broader, uh, a broader um, region than that if they like. But if we look at Southeast Asia, uh, IMET funds uh, have been uh, primarily targeted at our two treaty allies, uh, the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, between 2000 and 2009, uh, those countries used between uh, a million and a half and, and two and a half million dollars each. Uh, IMET funds have also gone to other ASEAN uh, countries, namely Cambodia, East Timor, uh, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Uh, we don't uh, have IMET programs with Singapore, um, Brunei, or uh, Myanmar or Burma. Uh, today, we the way we uh, organized our discussion was to have uh, input from two uh, fantastic experts uh, and people with perspective uh, on this question. And I think it will probably result in a, in a good discussion. I don't know about a debate, but I think a discussion with points of view is always uh, a good way to um, suss out some of the policy prescriptions uh, for an issue. We're, first, I'll introduce, uh, I, I'll introduce both speakers, and then I'll, we'll start with uh, Lieutenant General uh, Chip Gregson. Chip, is, as many of you know, was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs, and before that he served as the Chief Op Oper Operating Officer for the United States Olympic Committee. Chip knows a little something about IMET uh, in terms of hands-on experience. He was Commanding General of the Marine Force, or the Marine Corps Forces in the Asia Pacific at the Central Command, Marine Corps uh, Central Command where he led and managed over 70,000 Marines and sailors in the Mideast, Afghanistan, East Asia, Africa, uh, East Africa and Asia. And from 20, uh, 2001 to 2003, he was commanding general of all the Marine forces, Marine Corps forces in Japan. Um, prior to that, he was uh, director of Asia Pacific policy uh, in the office of the Secretary of Defense from 98 to, uh, to 2000 graduate of, of the U.S. Naval Academy, and holds master's de, uh, a couple master's degrees. John Sifton is the uh, Asia Advocacy Director of the Human Rights, of Human Rights Watch. He, his uh, portfolio there includes South and Southeast Asia, a region he knows quite a bit about. Uh, before joining uh, Human Rights Watch for the second time, he was the director of One World Research, which is a public interest and in investigation firm. He started his uh, at, at uh, Human Rights Watch uh, as a director, I'm sorry, as a re researcher in the Asia Division focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, John uh, has a lot of experience in South Asia, lived in um, Afghanistan and Pakistan and worked on those areas. He holds a law degree from New York University and a bachelor's degree from St. John's College in Annapolis. So I guess you guys share um, some experience in Annapolis and in Afghanistan, and let's see uh, if you share anything else. Um, so uh, I'd like to kick off this morning. Uh, Chip, I will give you a uh, first shot at it, and then uh, we'll turn to John, and, and then I will uh, moderate uh, the discussion. Please. Uh, thank you, Ernie, and I'm uh, happy to be here. The uh, uh, South 
East Asia program has really taken off <laughs> under your uh, under your guidance, and I think it's very valuable and even about time that uh, we started paying some attention to it. Uh, let me uh, try and set a uh, perspective or a framework on this by talking a little bit about uh, the overall purpose of our forces overseas and our defense engagement uh, or our national engagement programs uh, with the defense establishments of various other countries. It's really far broader and more constructive than just simply waiting for military action. Along uh, our active presence, as well as our engagement, including IMET and the many other programs of foreign military assistance with other countries, helps promote security, dampen sources of instability, deter, deter conflict, and give substance to U.S. security guarantees and commitments and ensure U.S. access. It multiplies our diplomatic impact and demonstrates professional military ethics in a democratic society. IMET, like all the other forms of military engagement, can be used to reward countries that do U.S. bidding. It also uh, can be used as a stick. Its refusal or its withdrawal can be used as punishment against countries that uh, have irritated the United States at one point or another. It can also become a very large issue when political or tactical exigencies override our objections to abuses in one country or another. We lavish military aid on Pakistan, yet we restrict it to Vietnam. One could also add Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan as other countries where we uh, provide aid uh, that we would otherwise refuse were we not involved in Afghanistan and Central Asia. IMET is designed to strengthen foreign militaries through skill training and exposure to values supporting a civilian controlled apolitical and professional military. It's also an instrument of influence. Relationship building with exposure at an early career stage is one of the benefits uh, cross-culturally of the IMET and other programs. And in this regard, I think a strong arguing, argument can be made that Americans benefit as much or more from this uh, as our foreign guests do. Um, we, um, as everybody in this room has no doubt noticed, we sometimes tend to have an attitude that it's all about us. And when you have to learn to get along with uh, people who speak a different language, do things differently than you do, and have a different tradition and a different view of history and a different view of America when you're a captain, say, as a junior officer, it's often a very instructive experience and one you wouldn't have otherwise. Stronger relations and enhanced mutual understanding of, of the perspectives of others then is one of the benefits of, of IMED as we go through this. In part to address some of the perceived uh, difficulties with the IMET program as it was begun in the beginning, we created e-IMET or expanded IMET in 1990. This opened up the IMET program to civilian officials of other governments and it was specifically an attempt to decrease the abuses. The types of training that were designed under the e-IMET were English language training, flying training, observation, uh, uh, on-the-job training, professional military education, meaning exchanges between uh, students at command and staff colleges and the like, technical training, military justice training, uh, civil military relations, defense resource management, and so on. Not exactly uh, what one would refer to as uh, training with close combat and hand-to-hand -hand and bayonet fighting. Um, the process begins at our embassies and includes careful vetting and screening. The ambassador in each of our countries therefore has oversight of this. Some programs are funded by the Defense Department, uh, many by the Department of State, uh, so they have oversight. And Congress has the ability and exercises it uh, fairly frequently to provide oversight. See, for example, Senator Leahy and his uh, efforts with Indonesia. Um, as a chapeau, perhaps, or as a concluding remark regarding the overall context for IMET, uh, a recent study out of this very institution here stated in part, forward presence and engagement are not simply helpful to shaping the environment and setting the stage for effective responses to contingencies 
They are indispensable for minimizing the likelihood of larger conflicts. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you, Chip. Uh, that was great. John, um, what's your perspective? Um, I'll try to keep this somewhat brief. Um, I'd like to go to questions because I think that's a good context in which to talk. But I I'm going to start my comments by discussing Indonesia. Um, I'd like to start with Indonesia because I think it's important to begin a discussion about IMED in Asia by acknowledging that there is in, in, indeed a debate about its utilities and consequences. And countries like Indonesia bring that debate into pretty sharp focus. Indonesia's military has, in the past, committed some pretty major human rights abuses, and it continues to have a problematic record with a lack of justice for those past abuses and even some impunity for current abuses. Um, but in July 2010, uh, the, the last remaining restrictions that were really being put on that military via the efforts of Senator Leahy uh, was removed. And Secretary Gates stood in Jakarta and, uh, with the Defense Minister of Indonesia and uh, the last restrictions on Kapasis, the, the unit that was engaged in some of the worst abuses, uh, were removed. Now, that moment um, when that happened, obviously Human Rights Watch disagreed with that. Um, that goes without saying. But that moment represents, I think, for, for, for the United States and the IMAT program, essentially the crystallization of what is perceived as the purpose of IMAT, which is to improve these militaries and also meet certain exigencies and desires of the U.S. government. It was decided at the Pentagon and the White House level that this was the right thing to do. And the reason was, the arguments usually go back and forth, um, that by standing on the outside and yelling at the Indonesian military, we will accomplish nothing. It's better to talk to them, engage with them, and this will ultimately improve the rights situation and make them a more rights-respecting military. Um, I guess, to be perfectly blunt, the Human Rights Watch position, the position of a lot of human rights groups are, there are some units and persons, and even governments, which, governments, not countries, which are not redeemable. And this is a real challenge for the IMET program. Um, I don't think that's the norm. It's definitely not the norm worldwide. But it's unfortunately all too common in Asia for there to be institutions and governments which are not redeemable. Um, I, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about people. And people may or may not be redeemable. That's a theological matter, I suppose. Um, but whether an institution is redeemable and in what circumstances, I mean, this is essentially the big policy question looming in the background. Um, it's funny because, of course, as a human rights group, we're considered to be progressive and the sorts like uh, criminal defense attorneys who often try to explain things away and say, you know, you're a bad person because of your background and your upbringing and whatever. But in reality, human rights groups are much more conservative. They often consider people to be unredeemable. And it is the Pentagon that is saying things like, well, you have to understand the context. We need to engage with them and understand where they're coming from. So we're often, you know, juxtaposed in a kind of funny way. Um, but anyway, the real, the real question is whether institutions are redeemable. And I guess the U.S. government is of the opinion that they are, and human rights groups are often of the opinion that they're not. Indonesia provides a snapshot of how the U.S. views that question of redemption. The U.S. government ostensibly believes the Indonesian military has reformed adequately. We disagree. Um, there are still some abuses in Papua and, and other places which are going on. But again, how do we get to this moment? Asia is a fertile ground for redemption, I suppose. Um, you know, you see throughout the region several other governments with rights abusing militaries, um, one, ones which have been engaged in various abuses. Uh, in Thailand, for instance, the military in the south is engaged in a lot of abuses in the, in the context of the insurgency in the south. The Philippines has a very long record of implications uh, for the military and the paramilitary groups in extrajudicial executions. But I think I, the country that 
probably crystallizes the biggest problem for IMET, human rights in Asia, Southeast Asia, is Cambodia. First of all, the program is very large per capita. It's a million dollars of military assistance um, for a country of about 14 million people. And you have a military which is dominated, or rather, you have a military which dominates the political scene. Um, the, the RCAF, the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces Commander-in-Chief, the Deputy Commander-in-Chief, the Army Commander, they're all on the permanent committee of the Cambodia People Party, the ruling party. The Minister of Defense, the Chief of the Navy, the Commanders of the Army, Army Region Number 1, Number 2, Number 3, and Number 4, and you go on and on and on. They're all on the Central Committee of the Cambodian People's Party. It's not an apolitical military by any stretch of the imagination. So you, uh, you ask yourself, you know, right off the bat, why are we working with this military? And then you consider the fact that the RCAF Commander-in-Chief and the Deputy Commander-in-Chief are Khmer Rouge veterans. Another issue from the 70s that hangs over them. And then finally, the vetting issue. Is it really possible to screen the Cambodian military when there is such a large record of abuse spanning all the way back to the 1970s? And even for the young officers, um, are we really up to the task? Our experience at Human Rights Watch is that problems with transliteration, poor data collection, some other problems. You see again and again and again officers being uh, considered, nominated, who are implicated in some very serious abuses now. Uh, land grabbing, um, the military is very implicated in, in basically being sponsored by corporate entities to grab land. But even beyond Leahy, Meta Leahy, you see a large number of young officers who would pass Leahy vetting. They're clean, you know, in terms of gross human rights abuses, but they are the sons of senior CPP cronies of Hun Sen, the prime minister. Uh, and so you say to yourself, well, they're not involved in gross human rights abuses, but this guy's a 24-year-old colonel, or this guy's a 27-year-old brigadier general. 29-year-old three-star generals. They're the sons of various high-level CPP officials. And you ask yourself, what's really going on here? And is it in the best interests of the human rights of the Cambodian people that we are training them? Now, I'll go, I could go on and on about this, but I won't. Um, what I'd like to conclude with is that this, this uh, panel is quite well-timed because on Friday, the White House released a new policy. It's called the U.S. Security Sector Assistance Policy. And uh, it attempts to deal with some of the underlying problems that I'm getting to, which is how do you reconcile these different aims, the U.S. aim to, to engage and to improve these governments, the exigencies that are being considered. Number three in that uh, policy, Policy goals are to help partner nations build sustainable capacity, promote partner support for U.S. interests. That's the excellence. Number three is promote universal values, such as good governance, transparent and accountable oversight for security forces, rule of law, transparency, accountability, delivery of fair and effective justice, and respect for human rights. Now, I guess what Human Rights Watch would submit is that that isn't possible with some militaries. Literally, it's not possible. You cannot give security sector assistance to certain militaries. Uh, they may pass vetting, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it if you are attempting to do those things. And I could explain more about why, but I won't go on and on. I think it would be better to do a Q&A. OK, thank you very much. I really appreciate the uh, opening positions. Just to clarify, uh, Chip, you're saying there's value and, and good return on investment for, for IMET, is that correct? It, yes, along with uh, our other security assistance uh, activities. Okay. And John, uh, your position is uh, IMET is 
what is your position? Is, would you would you use IMED in some countries? Yeah, or, I mean, or, and and not in other, but not in others. The issue decidedly is not is IMED a good thing or not. Right. I mean, obviously, it plays its role in certain countries, and there's some militaries which don't appear to have very serious rights abuse rights abuse records. I guess the problem is you have certain countries where you cannot simultaneously promote rule of law, good governance, and democracy, and find officers who are suitable for training. Because either the military is so politicized, like Cambodia's, or it's so hard to vet, also like Cambodia's, or third, uh, the whole unit distinction, the notion that they're individuals whose hands have blood on them and that they're others who are not is so difficult to untangle because the entire military has such a poor record of accountability that you're better off just not doing it. Now, you could limit it. You talked about rule of law training, uh, JAGs, and trying to train a military to have a better accountability mechanism, train them to have a better military justice system, train them to have account uh, accountability mechanisms, train them how to have, have inspector generals. You could do that, and that could be the limit to your IMAP program, and maybe we would have fewer objections in a situation like that. But when you look through the reports to Congress about all the IMAP, yeah, there's stuff like that in there, but oftentimes it's counterterrorism training, jungle warfare, maritime security. Some of it's innocuous humanitarian aid, but you don't see a huge amount of that type of training. So uh, we would submit, you know, don't do it. Pull the plug. Okay, let's open it up for questions. Uh, Mr. Sifton, thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to comment that actually um, there is no um, IMET going to COPASIS right now. Uh, the Robert Gates announcement was for a sort of limited um, DOD engagement, but not through the IMET program such as, as it is. Um, and then the second question, um, I guess, you know, when we consider our IMET programs at the State Department, the main thrust of the program is to um, allow rising leaders to come to the United States and participate in usually residential programs, um, professional military education like you know the War College or something. It's classroom-based, sort of graduate degree type things versus operational or technical training. So I was wondering whether, uh, from your point of view, um, you can make a differentiation between the value of that type of thing and then you know, very operational training, you know, marksmanship and stuff like that. What I'm really trying to get at is that there are certain contexts, and I don't think this is the norm or this is true all through Asia, but there are certain contexts where you can't find people who that type of training would benefit. Um, you have militaries which are so politicized, so corrupt, so involved in criminal activity that no matter who you find is going to have an overlord who is more important to them and their career than pleasing the U.S. or being friends with it or becoming professional. Again, it's not the norm, but I think there are certain militaries like that. I don't mean to stick on Cambodia, yeah. but that So I, I just want to do a follow-up question, John. So in a case where you have an unredeemable, un, a set of unredeemable institutions, what would, he, what would your view be on making progress? Uh, do you just walk away from them and let it fester and get worse? Do you, or, or how do you, what's the prescription right. when you get to that situation? Yeah. In a nutshell, what I would submit to both OSD and state is that the focus, if there must be engagement in, with a country that bad, solely on accountability mechanism. Say, we're going to help you create an inspector general slash civilian complaints review board slash uh, the military component of your Human Rights Commission, whatever it is in the country which has the oversight of the security forces, will help you train that entity and try to make your military more accountable and transparent. You could just do that. Or you could just threaten them, as, as certain countries have, just threaten them with a full uh, withdrawal of military assistance and then lay down the exact roadmap for how to get it back. Those are essentially the two options. 
quick follow up here because this is a, a point that I wanted to raise in our in our discussion. We uh, we've been tracking this very closely. China has been starting starting to mimic uh, U.S. military mill to mill engagement strategies in Southeast Asia, uh, and actually doing their own version of IMET, which doesn't really look a lot like American IMET, but uh, they are they are pulling larger numbers than we are. Um, uh, from regional militaries, and I wondered if uh, maybe Chip and John, you would comment on that. Are we are we leaving states uh, open to um, assistance that that might not have you know the the values based approach that uh, the U.S. has? Well, that question gets to one of the core dilemmas on IMET decisions, and not just IMET, but the other 14 different programs we have to aid other people's militaries. Is it better to engage or not engage? And um, anecdotal evidence, and pardon the anecdotes, but Ronald Reagan once said the two anecdotes constitutes data. But uh, um, the, during in Indonesia, in the early um, 2000s in the days of the uh, full Leahy uh, restrictions on training. We, could get, we, we were allowed to travel to Indonesia to do training on non-lethal weapons, and we used that to go there frequently. One of the mandatory things we had to do on the training was to start with a class on militaries in a democratic society and the military justice system. And of course, the, uh, uh, the Pentagon, God bless the Pentagon, created the class for us. And it was uh, 28 mind-numbing slides, uh, all to be given in, you know, with, with a lot of detail on them and everything. But nevertheless, the sessions, especially with the Indonesian junior officers, always turned out to be very exciting. These were captains that were fluent uh, in English, or at least competent, most fluent, and they'd, and they'd done their homework. We could not get through the class in the allotted time without all these captains bringing up incidents from the American past that we would prefer not to talk about or not even think about. Um, it uh, shows that they were thinking, and people that are past a certain age, uh, lieutenant colonel, colonel, are probably not going to reach them. They're, they're vested in the current system. They have a uh, – that – senior officer tendency to say, we've always done it this way, that's the way I'd like to continue doing it, that type of thing. But being able to get into these countries and work at the captain level with the junior officers and start shaping attitudes or at least raising questions, I submit, is far better than just uh, cutting everything off and saying uh, that, that you guys only have one choice and it's us, square yourselves away or we're, not, or we're never going to talk to you again. I don't think that that's... Uh, that's quite the best way. The other anecdote, the Trisakti University riots in 1998. Indonesian military, with one exception, got a really black eye out of it because of the way they treated the students. The one exception was the Indonesian Marines. And uh, quite by accident, I happened to be in Indonesia not, uh, not more than a few weeks after the Trisakti riots. And I was out in Surabaya with the Marines. and. Uh, was talking about the Trisakti riots and things, and I asked this group of senior officers, how is it you came off out of the riots with reputation enhanced and the Army did so badly? And this one colonel smiled at me and said, it's very simple, we didn't consider the students the enemy. We went in there in civilian clothes ahead of time, we negotiated the rules of engagement so that when it came time for us to do what we needed to do, the students understood what was going on, they understood that um, we had their best interest at heart, and we uh, didn't disagree with them doing this. And so I said, okay, Leavenworth or Quantico? And he said Leavenworth, and that's where he went to school. So small, small incidents, but yes, there, there, are, there, there are problems with IMET. There are problems with various governments. There are problems with certain sections of the militaries. But the, but the point comes down to is it better to try or is it better to withdraw? you know, kind of like you do with your kids, go sit in a corner until I feel better. So, Yeah, I guess we're certainly not saying, you know, every time a, a military is implicated in abuse, just withdraw, don't do any business with them whatsoever. But this issue of finding the redeemable folks, and again, I, you know, people are redeemable, uh, 
and even institutions are, um, is, is, is very difficult. And I guess I, what I'm saying is I'm not confident the U.S. government can figure it out. The Leahy problem, the vetting problem is just one component, but making wise decisions about who deserves fund, who deserves to be brought for course training and, and what kind of training and when, some good decisions get made, but some very bad ones do as well. And interestingly, the age thing doesn't always work out the way you'd expect intuitively. You know, the young officers are kind of promising and the old guard is, is old guard. I mean, after all, the person who's driving the reform in Burma is not a young officer, you know? It's a very old one. Um, with the TNI, uh, it, it's very interesting what's going on. I mean, maybe the Pentagon is right. Maybe things have, have gotten better. Recently, the eight Indonesian soldiers in Papua were, um, were killed by uh, the local insurgency there. Um, which is very small and very innocuous in many respects, but, you know, still has some lethal capacities. And we expected the TNI to go nuts, because that's what they've done in the past, but they didn't. And uh, it's not clear why, and I'm, the jury's still out. But as I said to some folks at OSD a few weeks ago, I don't think that one can say that it's a sure thing that they have reformed, there's evidence, we have evidence that there's a lot of impunity still there and that if things get bloody enough in Papua, there could be, you know, more abuses. But neither of us really has the evidence to say we are right and the other's wrong. And so we're both sort of arguing with each other with anecdotes and we don't have a lot to go with. But then there are other places like Sri Lanka and Afghanistan and Cambodia where I know we're right, <laughs> and the Pentagon has a big problem. There's nobody to be, you can find a couple of Navy units, a couple of young officers who aren't involved in any political activities, and you can train them in maritime security or something, maybe, although there's no maritime security in Afghanistan. Um, but for the most part, you have a, the whole entity is just messed up to the core, and there's really little, uh, there's very little to, to do. And so that's the question. What do you do then with those countries? And I guess what I'd suggest to them is either cut them off or be very tough with them. And that's what we're suggesting with Cambodia and Sri Lanka. Be very, very tough. Give them a road map like we're doing with Burma already, which has shown itself willing to reform. Uh, as, we, as, as Congress has done with the Philippines, give them a road map. This is what you got to do. Exactly what you need to do. And things will get better for you. A question here. Uh, Jonathan Broder from Congressional Quarterly. Um, I don't know whether we're including Central Asia in this discussion, but if we are, um, can both of you talk about the strategic imperatives of IMET in some of the Stan countries, in, you know, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, those places, and human rights concerns, the, the conflict between the two? Central Asia touches on uh, what I was trying to indicate with the tactical and political exigencies. Uh, we have something called the Northern Distribution Network that goes through Central Asia that is vital and might become even more vital if that's possible if we lose the lines of communication through Pakistan for the retrograde out of, uh, out of Afghanistan. Um, we've been on and off of a basing rela relationship with Uzbekistan uh, because of our concerns with uh, Uzbekistan's human rights record. Uh, we have a base in Kyrgyzstan uh, that uh, is problematic from a human rights record, but we can't, uh, we, we can't operate in Afghanistan without support from, pardon me, it's not a base, it's a transit center. Uh, specifically designed with those words, sorry, take base out of the record. Okay, strike uh, that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not allowed in the Pentagon now. I'd probably be shot if I crossed the parking lot on that. Uh, but but to, to be serious and not flip, uh, Manas has been a problem because of the very, very, the, of the compelling contingencies of being, uh, exigencies of being able to operate in Afghanistan versus uh, uh, 
what we would like to see happen in in Central Asia with with, with the human rights. It's it's not a clean thing. Um, and I would add, it's not just IMET, it's a number of all the other programs that we have going on, too. And, uh, for example, uh, uh, Global Peace Operations Initiative, or Mine Action, or Disaster Response, or, the, or Drug Interdiction, or the, the 1206 program, which recently, uh, out of Central Asia, but in, back in an Asian context, was key to cleaning up the terrorist transit routes among uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and, and the Philippines uh, in that it, triangle where they bound 1C. The, uh, uh, the, the bad guys were, were doing something in one country and fleeing to the other country, and we didn't have the proper surveillance means to do it. Now we've got the, now we've got the, right, sea sur the surface search radars established uh, with U.S. money that serves all three countries so that they can cooperate to clean this up. Uh, does that, uh, um, that could constitute uh, showing favoritism to a country um, uh, that uh, where we still have human rights concerns, uh, but it seems to serve a purpose. I used the example of the military aid that we lavish on Pakistan, yet we deny the same aid to Vietnam. Well, Vietnam doesn't have the same uh, impact on us with our operations in Afghanistan that Pakistan does at the moment, and Pakistan's got uh, other things that, uh, that, that concern us as well, and um, for example, their weapons program. So it's, it's not at all a clean decision. I met and all the other uh, uh, aid programs uh, on the <laughs> DOD and state side are mixed in with this reality and uh, one makes decisions in what one hopes is for the greater good overall. And uh, as John said, sometimes they work out, sometimes uh, you end up with blowback. John, Central Asia. Yeah, I mean, it sort of goes without saying that most of the Central Asian republics have human rights problems. I mean, that's a well-known fact. I think the Pentagon knows it. The White House certainly does. And they, they've made a decision to go forward because of the necessity. What's baffling about some of the countries in Southeast Asia is that the necessity is not there. I mean, can you think of a country in Southeast Asia that is less strategically important than Cambodia? I mean, what's, it's just, just sitting there. It's got this little coastline. I mean, no offense to Cambodia, but seriously, geostrategically, why is it an important country? It doesn't border China. It's got this short coastline. And yet, we lavish a lot of assistance. When you look at it per capita, it's probably the leader in the, in the region because it's only, you know, only 14 million people. And the, mil the, the Navy's only got 4,000 people in it. So, you know, it's got, it's got these huge programs. Um, and yet we don't seem to have any need to pull back on it. And, I, and I, would, I would submit that it's because the Pentagon and the State Department and the White House just don't realize how bad the human rights situation is. And I guess that's our fault. A uh, gentleman in the back here. Hi, my name is... That's on. Okay. Uh, this is Ravi Baller. I'm, I'm from Georgetown University. Um, for every good anecdote, there's a bad anecdote, and that's part of the problem. Maybe two is data, maybe three is data. And I think that's the biggest issue with IMET. Um, for example, in Indonesia, President Yudhoyono is a four-time IMET graduate, spent two years in the United States, has led a lot of the democratization, increased transparency, civilian control of the TNI. Uh, but that's just an anecdote, right? So I, I've just recently completed a study at Georgetown looking at the long-term benefits of IMET in Burma, in Myanmar. We had the program from 80 to 88. Mm -hmm. We trained 175 people, and there are currently 13 of those individuals in the, the government of Myanmar at this time, to include the vice president, several members of parliament. But I think the issue that we need to do, or what we need to focus on, is gathering the data in every country, good stories and bad stories. My list of IMEC graduates, I, I double-checked or cross-referenced that with the OFAC 
uh, special designated nations list. I cross-referenced it with NGO sources out there to see if there was any evidence that these IMET graduates convicted, or I mean, were associated with human rights abuses or had any, any activities, any behaviors that would be deemed illegal or immoral according to US policy. And I didn't find any. Um, I'll tell you what. But th this is something that I think we need to do. But let me just ask a, a question, though. And that's, I guess, in my research, I found that the positions of prominence, which is our main metric, is not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. We look at these people at the top levels. And as the general suggested, that um, that's, maybe that's not enough. We need the junior officers. We need the mid-grade officers. In order to have true organizational reform, shouldn't we be looking across the board and tracking officers across the board and to see if they take um, positions as instructors or training and doctrine commanders and look for knowledge transfer? You know, do they publish? Do they write white papers and try to become better? Thanks. Uh like to see that report, by the way. Uh, don't leave without talking to me. But uh, any comments on that? Reactions on Myanmar? Yeah, and, I mean and the study in general. I mean, l let me just say at the outset that the fact that you didn't find anything doesn't mean anything. I don't mean to be insulting, but Burma is a black box, and the office of the Secretary of Defense is the first office that would agree with that. The intelligence file in the country and its leadership and its military leadership is thin. It's sparse. And it's sparse not because there isn't information out there in the Wittgensteinian sense. It's because it's not written down. And it's not in the Invest uh, Leahy vetting database. It's not in the intelligence community's database. It's literally just not there. It doesn't mean that Commander so-and-so, who happened to be here in 1986, didn't lead a unit in Kachin and slaughter a bunch of people. It just means nobody wrote it down. And that's the problem. You see again and again and again, less so in Indonesia and Thailand and Pakistan, but definitely more so in Burma and Cambodia and a lot of other places where there just isn't a lot of hard written down evidence of what the history is. Then you add on top of that transliteration problems with the data that does exist, and you have a recipe for a lot of misplaced assumptions. You just, you don't know what you're dealing with. You have what Donald Rumsfeld would call a lot of unknown unknowns. George Nicholson, a policy consultant for special operations. One of my favorite quotes was, in the search for the absolute, the best that's possible is destroyed, and the longing for perfection is akin to madness. And I think using a litmus test of, of who we're going to give aid to or not, and I think that uh, General Gregson, you can talk to this. Many of this, the uh, events I've been to, uh, representatives have said, we create tre created tremendous problems for ourselves in Pakistan under the Church Amendment, where not only did we shut down everything, prior sales that we had authorized to them, kicking their students out of uh, our military schools, and there is a huge void there that the relationships that were developed before that with Pakistani officers who are now senior Pakistani officers, we can carry on that dialogue. With the junior officers who grew up during that void, they are extremely distrustful of us. And again, I think General Gregson, if you can talk to that. Pakistan's uh, unique in a number of ways. Um, while I was in office, uh, we knocked ourselves out to uh, be of aid to Pakistan uh, in the uh, floods. Uh, we, we sent forces there right away to help the Pakistanis to recover from the floods. The, uh, uh, we, pu we pushed helicopters uh, to them, all these types of things. Uh, our senior military representative in Pakistan at the time said, don't think this is going to change public opinion polls a bit. We went into that relief effort with about a 15 percent uh, public opinion poll rating, and we came out with an 11 percent public <laughs> opinion poll rating. Um, the, uh, um, We've had, uh, in my opinion, uh, our relationship with Pakistan over the decades has been um, a bit schizophrenic. Uh, they go from gallant ally to pariah, and then we bring them back instantly to be gallant ally again. And then, uh, and so they're, 
there is suspicion that um, um, uh, we're changeable, that uh, we use them. I don't believe it, but uh, from their perspective, it's well ingrained and, uh, and, and, and thoroughly believed. Um, that's one case. Uh, drawing a uh, straight line or a linear projection from, from the Pakistan case to other countries uh, may provide some illumination, but uh, I'd be very careful of applying everything uh, uh, that we think we observed or the lessons that we think we learned out of Pakistan to directly to other countries. Very quickly, I mean, the question is causality, and I think it's always very difficult to figure out what's going on causally. You don't train them. They go off, commit abuses, hate us, hate the U.S., excuse me. Um, you do train them. That doesn't happen, maybe. It's very difficult to tell. I mean, we've lavished a lot of assistance on Malaysia, but a lot of Malaysian politicians say horrible things about the United States. We lavish military assistance on Cambodia, and it's still rights abusing. So the causality, I, I don't saying, uh, Human Rights Watch isn't going to say we have the answers to all the causal information, but I, we certainly have enough data to poke a lot of holes in the causal arguments, the causality arguments the Pentagon makes. And that's why I say it's not really that we're right and they're wrong. It's more like neither of us really know a lot about this causality issue, what affects what, what gets what outcome. I th and I think it would be good if, if there was an acknowledgment, and I think there is. I, I have to say, by the way, that Assistant Secretary Mark Lippert and Deputy Assistant Secretary Vikram Shah, are, as Vikram Singh, are, are, are aware of this. They understand that the causality um, continuum is, is not well known, that we don't really know what's going on. And that's good, because the profession of ignorance is, is a step in the right direction. Yeah. So I think one of the issues we have to address at some point is if we don't know do we engage or do we not engage? Uh, that's, that's a question. Uh, right here in the, in the center. Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm from Chevron. And just wondering if we could weave in the private sector component to this. Um, we have quite a significant footprint in many of these countries in Southeast Asia. And for us, uh, sort of the intersection of security and human rights issues is is extremely important and something that we are um, obviously concerned with. Uh, we are members of the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, which is an effort to work with governments and NGOs to sort of find local, you know, we, we address some of these issues working alongside some of these public security forces. but you know, one of the biggest challenges is not always having the buy-in from the top of these, in these countries with the um, military institutions and then um, necessarily being able to work with, um, whether it's the U.S. military or in the case of Southeast Asia, the Australian military, for instance. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, whether it's, if it's not IMET, but some of these other mechanisms to address some issues related to security and human rights. Uh, I think private, uh, the, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, private sector is also uh, stuck on that interface of varying interpretations of contract law, too, and all the things that uh, uh, are covered by the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and things, that, uh, which, which makes you uh, an arm of the, or a powerful component of the whole American values message. Uh, and corporate involvement, uh, private sector involvement is uh, exceedingly important in all this. If it's just the government working with something, then um, it's not all that compelling. Uh, Chevron's efforts, other major companies, uh, and, and even minor companies, uh, the private sector involvement means things that directly affect the lifestyles and the uh, earning power of everybody there. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's exceedingly important and exceedingly important that uh, the private sector continue to, I think, uh, uh, 
forward or promote the U.S. human rights brand, which I think is one of the strongest components we have. Uh, I think the differences between John and I are about uh, uh, the implementation of that message, not the, um, uh, not the value of it. Speaking of that, uh, we've been uh, banging on Cambodia a bit, but uh, America's got a moral obligation in this area, too. We have a moral obligation to Vietnam. We were there for quite a long time. Uh, the spillover of that war into Cambodia and to include the U.S. incursions into Cambodia had a lot to do with uh, uh, setting the conditions for the rise of the Khmer Rouge and, uh, and the rest of the denouement of this whole thing. Uh, I was uh, struck uh, on a visit to Cambodia about the extensive efforts that the UN was, was putting in there to teach young women the facts of life about motherhood. Uh, the Khmer Rouge depredations had broken the chain from grandmother to mother, et cetera, that, uh, that did all this in a traditional society, but uh, uh, it was, at the time I visited, it was really broken and the efforts of the international community, the efforts of the private sector, as well as government efforts to uh, start from basics and uh, work uh, Cambodia back up uh, to a functioning society, a functioning country within the Cambodian cultural norms, not going in there like Americans do and saying we want to create an American-style stock exchange and things, uh, which we've done before, uh, but uh, doing it in a uh, manner supported by the international institutions and one that, that was appropriate in the context where we were trying to do it uh, works. Now, I understand the human rights objections uh, to um, uh, the Cambodian military, but again, uh, we're back to differences of view on implementation. How do we fix this? How do we, how, how do we get to the, uh, to, to the right ending that we want? Um, last point on that, I would think that uh, we should have learned on 9-11 uh, that um, chaos in any part of the world can create a threat in many other parts of the world, and we can't fix governance in every place at the same time, but we can do what, we, uh, do what we're able to do on the political side, the diplomatic side, the private sector side, the business side, to, uh, to rebuild places that are tending toward chaos so that we don't... Uh, uh, create so we don't end up realizing a bigger problem somewhere down the line. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, uh, on uh, private sector stuff, first, I think the two biggest problems that are implicated is one, you have certain militaries like Burma's um, and Cambodia's and Thailand's, which uh, you have subunits or even the whole enchilada are involved in their own revenue creation. <laughs> They're in business. Um, a lot of local commanders in Cambodia are essentially, I mean, it, the prime minister has announced there's corporate sponsorship for military units. And so when there's a land concession and the people have to be moved off the land and security needs to be called in to do that, uh, the local military commanders are called in. But they're not called in as government officers. They're called in uh, for pay, almost guards for hire. So, you know, that, that's one thing. The revenue transparency is a big problem with Burma. And, you know, we've always, we've said to Derek Mitchell in Rangoon, we've said, we said to Kurt Campbell a million times, you know, you've got to push the military not just on the abuses but on the revenue transparency. Uh, and then the, 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 the issue of um, them just being involved in private business needs to be pushed. You know, the idea that it is not appropriate for a military to be in business needs to be pushed. And I think, you know, again, we're all for dialogue. It's not about cutting them off. It's about telling them what's up and what they need to do to change things. Now, about this moral, I just have to respond to this moral, very quickly about this moral issue in Cambodia. Human Rights Watch obviously agrees there's a moral obligation to Cambodia. The Paris Peace Agreements of 1991 were a party U.S. is a party to those agreements, and those agreements obligate all the signatories to promote human rights and democracy in Cambodia. It's just <laughs> our position is when you have somebody who's been in power for 27 years, for 10,000 days plus, who himself was involved with the Khmer Rouge in 1975 and some of the genocidal acts that were carried out 
in the Eastern Zone, and the RCAF commander in chief was a Khmer Rouge commander, and so on and so forth. And you have all these millions of Cambodians who are living in this one party state without democracy. Um, you have an obligation to try to fix that, and it's precisely by using things like the pressure of conditionality in the Appropriations Act or the Pentagon talking tough about what needs to happen or the ambassador saying, hey, guys, if you don't – it's been 20, you know, it's been 27 years, it's been 21 years since the Paris Peace Agreements. If you guys don't shape up, one day we're not going to be there for you. You know, talking tough is, is, is a uh, – is a necessity here, and that is consistent with having the moral obligations that you know you referred to. John, I think uh, just one question on that. Some some people see that in the new there's a new sort of geostrategic balance, and if you allow a country to you know you give the country those choices, you basically push them completely into the hands of of a, a very welcoming China. How how do you guys think about that issue? Well, in the new context, what I'd say is. Uh, Burma was pushed into the arms of the China. They didn't really like it. And that's probably one of the causal factors that led them to realize that they should open up to the United States and everybody else. So our, our position is, if we're being so friendly with Hun Sen and he's still carrying China's water like he did during the ASEAN summit last year, then why don't you just push them all the way into China's orbit and see how they like it? Because I don't think they will, and maybe that'll make him a little bit more uh, amenable to doing business with the U.S. But he's kind of a special case because I think the solution to Hun Sen is, is only tough talk. There's no diplomacy to be had there. Okay. I'm going to give each uh, contest uh, contestant <laughs> each. <laughs> there, there will be a prize at the end of this. What's I'm, reverting, I'm reverting to my, my natural state as game show host. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's the price that's right? <laughs> <laughs> only Murray knows. Uh, <laughs> But a, a chance for each of you to make a, a, a short uh, final statement. It's been a great discussion. Chip, you want to start? Uh, the questions were all very good. The, uh, and I'm glad that Ernie limited us to 10 minutes apiece because it's always much more interesting to hear comments and respond than it is for us to graze around the landscape trying to find an idea while we're talking. Uh, the um, the, in, in the days now when we're talking about uh, uh, in, when we're becoming more inward looking, when we're questioning uh, what we're doing overseas, uh, these are the right things to talk about. We need to make sure that we preserve our ability to shape the environment, to reassure allies and friends, to promote those values that the, that, uh, the United States likes to aspire to uh, and to influence uh, friends and allies in those directions. Uh, there's no shortage of evil out there, both wholesale and retail. And uh, to the extent that we can try and affect some of this is, uh, um, uh, is, is, is the right thing to do. The, um, the uh, question was, was posed about measures of effectiveness on this, and that's, that's a uh, easy concept to grasp, but a very, very difficult one to, 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 to get under control. And, uh, but that's the way we need to go to make sure that uh, in our differing views of what we need to do with assistance to other countries that we're promoting in the end what we want to promote uh, and making sure that, uh, as John just said, that we're delivering the right message uh, with uh, um, people who espouse views that we do not support. Sorry, I would just close by saying the debate isn't about whether IMET should exist. It does exist. Um, it has consequences. The debate is really about what those consequences are, good or bad, and whether there are decisions the government can make to promote the good consequences, mitigate the bad ones. Um, and what that would mean in practice is basically, you know, three things. You could either do more of the same, just keep running IMET and the email IMET and everything else the way it is. Um, just keep doing it the way it's going. Uh, nobody, I think, actually thinks that should be done. Number two, which is what I think the White House announced last Friday, is try to improve. Um, keep doing IMED and the other programs and INCL and everything else, um, but try to improve the substance in the process. 
better courses, better substance to the courses, picking better people to attend as opposed to cronies and you know unmitigatable people, better Leahy vetting, understanding that the databases that exist are insufficient. Um, and then last, if you really want to improve everything, it's just rethink everything and recognize that although in many cases nothing is wrong, seriously wrong with the program, there are some countries where everything is, is wrong. And the administration of IMED and, and analogous programs are a total disaster and should be scrapped. And I'm not suggesting everything's wrong with IMED worldwide, but it should, there are certain places and contexts in which everything is wrong and we need to rethink everything and we need to be willing to cut or threaten to cut the assistance um, as appropriate. John Sifton, uh, Chip Gregson, thank you very much. I think this discussion uh, really goes a long way towards helping us think about uh, important institution and engagement and uh, how we use these things. So I thank you very much, and uh, hopefully we can uh, carry this discussion on further. Thank you all for joining us today at CSIS.